Victory Baptist, Baptistic Distinctives, and we're in the Law and Grace Doctrine, if you remember. I know it's been a while. Um, we covered uh, uh, some of it last last time, and now we're going to get into three errors that have troubled the church touching the right relations of the law and grace. You mean errors? Yes. On any doctrine that's in this Bible, you can go extreme. You can go too far to the right, too far to the left. You can. That's how culture started. Um, uh, and uh, being a Bible-believing church, which means that we believe that the King James Bible is the inspired, perfect, pure Word of God, being, being that, uh, it, seems, it seems that we're being taught that only Bible believers that really believe the King James Bible can be the ones that are trapped into these extremes because they believe every verse of the Bible. And if they haven't studied things through thoroughly and don't believe in balance, next thing you know, we have hyper-dispensationalists. We have people that will take the grace of God and they're using it a totally different way than the Scripture teaches it. And um, a lot of these are back doing what they used to do before they were saved uh, because they dropped the ball. And even when you talk to them, they'll drink, they're smoking, they'll say, hey, I'm saved going to heaven. They'll just maintain that thing that they got perfect peace because they have liberty to do what they got to do. And it's not by their works of righteousness, but it's by Christ. And next thing you know, you just look at them and it, you can't even argue with them because apparently they haven't read their Bible, the Pauline epistles, enough to know that what they're doing is wrong. But at any rate, when any time you can put somebody under a law for salvation, you know, then uh, what will happen is that person will be in total bondage to the lawgiver. For instance, if I was still a Catholic, I would be under the laws of the Roman Catholic Church, from the popes, the archbishops, the bishops, the cardinals, so on and so forth. When they come together, they make, they make what's called church dogma. And those are the laws that I would be under, period. Where, in our case, we hold up our King James Bible and we say that between these two covers, this is, this is, this is how we live. This is our practical uh, application of life. This is, this is our laws and dictates or whatever uh, uh, to please our Lord. But as far as me keeping all this in this book to be saved and go to heaven, no way, Jose. There's no way. See, if anyone could keep the law, if anyone could be good enough, then Jesus Christ would not have had to die for us. Period. There's nothing after that. It's just period. So, we know that uh, we're saved by grace through faith. And um, we're sticking with it. Amen. But at any rate, Baptists have been known also to um, have some splinter groups. And I'm going to be saying there's three, there's three here that uh, are the main ones throughout Bible history and Christianity. One is antinomianism. Antinomianism. I never heard of that before. I know. Or the denial of all rule over the lives of believers. The affirmation that because saved by God's free grace, holy without merit, men are not required to live holy lives. You know what I was just telling you? That's what these people are falling into. This name that I just gave you, whether they know it or not, has been around for a while. It's nothing new. And there's a lot of dispensationalists that believe this. And um, they profess that they know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Is that in the Bible? Yes, we are going to go to a Bible verse. It's going to be in the Pauline epistles, pastoral epistles, Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1. We're talking about this antinomianism. That's the denial of all rule over the lives of believers. 
The affirmation that because saved by God's free grace, holy without merit, men are not required to live holy lives. Now, there's some verses to support that. If you take parts of verses, you can support anything. You can support suicide and the whole shot, amen? There's verses in here that you can take part of it, and you can prove anything from the Word of God. But this is what the Bible says, just so you see this, that there's going to be things that are taking place. And, um, well, Titus chapter 1 in the qualifications and uh, verse 16, is that what I said? Verse 16 is what I just read. It says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. What does that mean? Does that mean here you are, you're not trying to smoke or cuss or hang around with people that do, for your own benefit, you know, by you not doing that doesn't mean uh, uh, that you're going to be saved. It means because you're saved, you don't want to do that. And I don't know why they can't see this. And the older I get, I'm starting to side with some of these other preachers, and I don't want to because I fought this sense of thinking everybody's lost. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what in the world's going on. I mean, I could see if you were, if you were backslidden and admitted or something. But when you fight, when you fight people that are trying to live a separated holy life, and you're trying to fight them saying what they're doing is wrong, and you're defending yourself for doing right, you fit, the t- you fit this verse. Don't, you, don't they? Did you see that verse in Titus 1.16? They profess that they know God. Oh, I know God. Yeah, grace of God. He paid for everything. I don't have to do nothing. Okay, you're telling me that. I don't want to have any doubtful disputations with you. You said you know God, you, you know say, but I think you're wacko. Because the Spirit in you is holy. So why would, why would, how could the Spirit in you that's holy get along with you doing wrong on the outside? You know, it's, it's simple stuff like this, if you tell them that, they, they can't comprehend something simple like that. And when you say that, right away you're, um, you're judging them. And you shouldn't be judging them because they're going to let you know about that. And, and you're sitting back and you're wondering, what, what's going on here? I don't understand. I didn't, say you wouldn't, I didn't say you were sinless. Like the preacher says, the older you get, you should be sinning less in this old man. I mean, the, the new man ought to have more control. But you, you get people that have been saved late in life. And right away, they know how wicked they are. All of a sudden, God goes in there and they look at their self, and then they start getting doubts about if they're saved or if they're worthy or not. And that's how they grow in the Lord. When you start giving them verses, they get excited. Wow. I mean, that's in there? You know, you go to Romans chapter 7, you, you, you talk to them about uh, the flesh and the spirit and start showing them some things, how the body wants to do this, but the spirit doesn't want it. And they start, and they click. That's what's going on. You know, in me. But they know because a light came on in there. And so they feel bad that they don't have victory over anything. And they grow and they pray and ask God for victory. That's normal Christian living. But these other people that have taken this grace of God and like this this uh, designation, anti-nominism, uh, suggest they just deny all rule and regulations. Saying since they're saved, they're going to heaven anyway, and they don't have to keep anything. It's just nuts anyway, that's all I can tell you. And they didn't get that from the Holy Spirit. And uh, these same types of people try to get converts. And that's why it almost makes you think some of them aren't saved. Go to Jude 4, that's just before the book of Revelations. You know, right away they say, well, didn't you ever think anything bad? Didn't you ever do anything bad? I said, we ain't talking about me. And we're not talking about what I think. If you want to talk about what I think, I think, yeah. I can get backslidden as hell sometime, but I know I'm backslidden. And I know it ain't right. Over here in Jude and verse 4, look what this says. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Crept in where? Into the body of Christ. And look what goes on. 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of, of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They say, see there? Well, this isn't, this isn't, we, we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. No, you don't. You may believe in Jesus Christ. You may be saved, but you don't believe he's the Lord. Lord means he's the top dog, man. He's the boss. And it wasn't their original idea to turn that grace into that. They picked up on that from somebody else. Just like, you know, oh, yeah, I studied the Bible and I got this. No, you didn't. You heard somebody. You took that avenue and now you're, you're trapped because you know it ain't right. And uh, uh, Dr. Noe used to always tell us the hardest thing for a guy to do is once he takes that one wrong road, he says very few can turn around and go back because of pride. And that's true, man. That is true. So, at any rate, God Almighty is instructing us that there's going to be these people, and they could be devils in disguise, who knows. But they, they go into the churches, and they, they start certain doctrines and certain things to get things messed up. It's that spirit. And then good people might have a downtime in their Christianity, and it just so happens these people will be right there. And if they follow that, they get messed up. And that's, but that's another reason why God put pastors, right? Had elders in the church and everything to help people when they're going through problems. But a lot of people just don't want to seek help. They, their pride will get you. So anyway, if you ever see that big long word, word antinomianism, then you know that just means denying all rule as a Christian. And then you have what we call ceremonialism. Now, in its first form, the demand that believers should observe the Levitical ordinances. What do you mean, Levitical ordinances? Well, if you remember from uh, Leviticus, that's the book that tells you about the Levites. It's got Levi's name in it, Leviticus, and about the priesthood. So about what they do about the temple, what they do about worship in the temple, the different kinds of offerings, and so on and so forth. You get into all that. There's ceremonialism. Uh, the first time it's uh, uh, referred to is people that observe these ceremonies of the Old Testament. And um, so, so you understand that. And, 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 in, and in Acts chapter 15, go to Acts chapter 15, and whenever anybody says anything like, maybe tries to divide Peter and Paul or whatever, you say, well, that, that could be, but Acts 15 changed everything. If you can remember just simply Acts 15 changed everything, then that will shut a lot of people up. Because, you see, Acts 15 is the council of Jerusalem where they all came together and they, they just got it straight. And the one thing they didn't make a law, but they, 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 they all agreed on was drinking blood. <laughs> it's telling Gentiles, ain't no blood drinking, man. If you <laughs> so somebody always says, well, I like my meat raw and it's dripping with blood. I said, whatever, man. It's just funny how, and I, you know, you pray and ask God's blessing and do whatever you got to do, but I just find this sort of consistent that God doesn't like anybody doing that, you know. So uh, it's not a law. You can do what you want. I just prefer to have it a little bit cooked. But anyway, Acts 15 right here. Look at verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said... Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So you see, it's ceremonialism. Here, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apostles are preaching that gospel, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And um, these men came all the way down to try to say, you got to do this too. That's part of that ceremonialism. So the modern form of this error is the teaching that Christian ordinances are essential to salvation. And that's where you have Church of Christ and others. Church of Christ will say that you have to be baptized to be saved. No, don't work like that. A Catholic Church will say you've got to drink, you've got to have the Holy Eucharist, they call it. That's the body of Christ, right? And the blood actually turns into his blood, and the bread actually turns into his body to maintain your salvation. You know. These two are ceremonial. It's all part of that ceremonialism. It's garbage. It don't work. It, it just don't fly. So that's pretty 
pretty simple there. Now, the third one is Galatianism, and that's taken from the book of Galatians. And um, it's the mingling of the law and grace, the teaching that justification is partly by grace, partly by law, or that grace is given to enable an otherwise helpless sinner to keep the law. Now, against this error, the most widespread of all, the solemn warnings, the unanswerable logic, the emphatic declarations of the epistle to the Galatians are God's conclusive answer. And um, if you go to Galatians chapter 3, when anybody tries to mix these two together, God in his word specifically has some scriptures that cover this. Colossians, remember that, Galatians, Ephesians. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 2 and 3. It's important for you to see this. It'll help you out. Colossians 3, 2 and 3 says, This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Right there, that's, you answer that question uh, the way you should, and that'll answer any argument against Galatianism. It was by faith, not by works, that you got saved. Period. So that should be the end of the question. It should be the end, or it should be your answer, right? And look at verse three. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? I mean, Paul's getting mad because the spirit has entered into this church. That's why he's addressing it with this letter. He's, and if he's working logically and simply. He's just basically asking these people, listen, how in the world did you get saved? And they'll say, you know, remember Romans was written earlier. Well, we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and what would you do? Well, we, I cried out to him and I got saved because it tells you, you know, to do that. Okay, so why did you have to ask him to save you? Because I couldn't save myself. Okay then that was because you believed in what he said, right? Yeah, okay. So then it was by faith, right? Yes, no problem. Then why in the world are you circumcising? Why in the world? Well, because these guys come down there and they tried making us feel guilty because Moses and God had a thing going. And you know, if, if, if God was angry back then, he's got to be angry now. You know, so Paul's getting crazy. He's, he's telling you foolish Galatians. Don't let yourself get that way. That's why Christians are so messed up today. Somebody slipped them a Mickey, we call it, you know, knocked them out long enough and put something in their brain or something. Because now they're walking around and they're confused. They don't know whether they're saved in or out. And, and a lot of the brethren say you, shouldn't, you, you, you would never be that way if you are saved. But apparently, maybe their brains are a little bit better or something. But a lot of people have taken in certain information, believing it to be... a um, authoritative information by some godly man of God and they got confused about what they did for instance you know did you ever repent enough what is repenting enough I mean I know people that went completely crazy with this stuff I went nuts with some of it because they said you couldn't do this this or this after you were saved or you weren't saved I mean anything can trip you up if you don't know the Bible, if you're not reared in a Christian atmosphere and, and you believe that all the guys that step behind the pulpit are, are men of God and you want to trust them, you want to listen to them, then they come up with this stuff and you're sitting there and you're confused. And once you start doubting it, it's like a never-ending thing because you call God a liar every time you do that stuff. And then you over and over again have to try to get assurance. And it's all because you got to step back and you got to see if you did what God told you to do. Did you do what God told you to do? Did something happen to you or not? I mean, I mean, has your mind changed? Is there something, is there a different direction you want to go in now? I mean, you know, there's some things that you can assure yourself with and you can think about saying, hmm. And so in this Galatianism, right away Paul answers this. And then in, in Galatians 1, go to chapter 1, and verses 6 through 8.
chapter 1, 6 through 8. Come on, stuck together. This is Paul to the church. He says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Because, you see, any time you add anything to death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're, it's another gospel. Which is not another. Look what he says. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, the gospel means good news. And what he's saying right here, there's only one real gospel. So if you're removed from that one true gospel, then you're following another gospel, which isn't really the gospel. That's what he's saying. And um, because it's a perversion. But though we, and this is heavy duty, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which... We have preached unto you, let him be what? Accursed. That's heavy duty. So all these denominations that are adding water, baptism, or tongues, or anything to that, these are another gospel. When they put on their big old signs, we're preaching the full gospel? That's what they're saying. The Baptists ain't got the full gospel. All we got is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's all we got. They got speaking in tongues. They got all this other stuff. The Church of Christ has the water, the baptism for the remission of sins. And um, it's just amazing that they don't understand that that's another gospel. See, the full gospel comes in threes. Death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. Maybe we ought to do that. If we ever get a new sign. We preach the full gospel I'll put on it. That'll, boy, that'll get the brethren going. And then underneath I'll put... You know, First uh, Corinthians 15, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures. <laughs> anyway, I, I, that's going through my mind. I think that would be perfect will of God. Now, the following uh, may be helpful as an outline of Scripture teaching on this important subject. The moral law only is referred to in the passages cited. Uh, what the law is. You go to Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. We're going to show you what the law is. If you have Romans 7 and verse 12, wherefore the law is what? Holy, right? And the commandment is what? Holy and just and good, right? Is that what yours says? Okay, then you go to, uh, you're right there in Romans 7, look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So this is giving you, this just describing what the law is here for us. And then also in verse 22, and notice it's all in chapter 7 of the book of Romans. Because the Christian has to graduate out of 7. you got to grow, you got to understand 7 to really get start to get mature in the Lord, because you got to understand that battle between the body and the and the, and the, and, the, and the spirit, and you got to understand that what your body wants to do, opposite of what God wants you to do, and you have to understand the law of your body and your members, and the law of your mind. There's so many things in chapter seven, so about the law, but here it's telling you, it's telling you about the law right here, and it says in 22. For I delight in the law of God after the what? Inward man. So if I delight in the law of God after the inward man, apparently the outward man don't delight in it. Yes or no? Not a trick question. Since God is being specific and he used the Apostle Paul to tell you that it's the inward man that loves it, the inward man is the new man. The inward man is the perfect man. Of course he's going to love it. Why would... Law ain't going to offend him. That's the character of God. And we're made in the image of Christ. I'm telling you. But the outward man, this stinking flesh, it's got a problem with it. Sure it does. And um, and we know that because... Uh, let's see here. Okay. And... and Okay, I got that right. 722. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Okay. 
Now, first, uh, uh, Timothy 1 8. Go there. We've got two more verses under what the law is. And then we'll go into the lawful use of the law. In 1 Timothy 1 8, the Bible says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it how? Lawfully. See that? That's what the law is. Then also, you don't have to turn there, but Galatians 3.12 says this, And the law is not of faith. <laughs> the law is not of faith. Why? Because it's of works. It's telling you what you should and shouldn't do. Now, that's what the law is. We know it's holy. We know it's holy. We know it's holy. We know it's just. We know it's good. We know it's uh, spiritual. We know... Uh, all these things. We know that the new man loves it. Now, the lawful use of the law. You back in Romans chapter 7 and um, verse 7 and also verse 13. So, 7, 7 and verse 13 of Romans. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law... For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. That verse 13. So what is that saying? You wouldn't know anything if that law wasn't there. So how would you use the law lawful? Well, when the law says something's wrong, you're a Christian, you just go ahead and do it? No. You don't do it. Right? Because your inside man says what? Don't do it. So where's the power? Inside. The outside man perisheth. The old man is our problem. So to use that law lawfully, it's recognizing what's right and wrong and doing what's right as a Christian. You don't say, okay, I can do wrong now because I'm saved anyway. I'm not under the law. God forbid. And in Romans 3.20, that's a good old one there. 3.20, Romans 3.20, Bible says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. But now here's, here's the answer to our thing, the lawful use of the law. For by the law is the knowledge of what? Sin. So it's okay for a Christian to sin then? No, it's not. Well, how do you know what sin is? The law. Duh. It's pretty simple. It's okay, James. You're bright. The light's flicking on and on. Amen. And then Galatians 3.19. It says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It says it was added because of transgressions. So how are you going to use it lawfully? You're going to figure out, because of the law, what sin is, and you're not going to do it. Oh, we're all sinners. We're saved by grace. Listen, no kidding, Sherlock. But if the law reveals to you that something's wrong, because that's his job... The outward man doesn't like it, but the inward man does. And the whole object is, is to tell the outward man that he needs to shut up and he's dead. And the new man on the inside is supposed to fulfill the law. How do you do that? Well, somebody said, let's see, if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How did you know you had lust of the flesh? Because the law came. Why would you get? Why would you? Why in the world would you want to get saved? Because the law came and I died. Why did you die? Because now you figured it out. Even if I thought this or if I did this, I broke all of it. Oh my goodness, I'm a mess. How am I ever going to get to heaven? There's no more temple. There's no more sacrifice. I mean, how in the world am I going to get to heaven? Well, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, He's going to provide that way. Why? Because He fulfilled the law. He never sinned. 
But after you're saved doesn't mean you start sinning lawfully. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. And so, also in, in, in Romans 3.19, it says this, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Why? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before who? God. 319. That's why when somebody says, well, I shouldn't have to feel bad. People shouldn't have to feel bad coming to church and, and uh, you know, to be saved and everything. Well, i got too many verses that tell me that's all part of the process. That's all part of the process. If you're not a sinner, why would you need a Savior? I mean, when somebody says you're a sinner, that sort of hurts your pride a little bit, I would imagine. And when you give them the list of those commandments, and they look at them, that com those commandments will convict you. You know, let's see, you can check them off. I'm not a murderer, I'm not this, I'm not that. Uh-oh, thief, liar. Oh, my goodness. Covet? Oh, nobody covets, do we? Yeah. And uh, anyway, they'll be guilty before God. So law has but one language. What things soever it speaks only to condemn. That's what the law does. Galatians 3.10 says this, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And in James 2.10 it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And then in 2 Corinthians 3.7 the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. That's talking about law. That's why Paul said, when the law came, I died. He also, I believe, said something about it being a school teacher leading him to Christ. See, all these little things that are in your Bible that a lot of Christians don't even know, they don't read, can help them out and help others that are struggling to understand what the deal is here. And also in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, the law is, it says it's the ministration of condemnation. And in Romans 7, 9 again, it says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And then 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56, it says this about sin, the strength of of sin is the law. So why is there so much sin? Why is so much perversion going on and coldness and uh, just, what do you call, scarred minds and everything? When the school system starts teaching kids that there's no law, when they start to remove the law of God out of the minds of children and they get older, you see, there's nobody to say a definite what a definite sin is. That's why the sodomites are gaining ground. That's why everything's gaining ground now, because there's no sin. You know, who's to say what sin is? All them Christians, you know, they put that stupid law up there. You know, we can't stand that. I mean, after all, our government kicked it out, didn't they? So when you kick out the law, if that's the school teacher to get people to get saved, if that's the condemnation, and you remove that, and you try to keep teaching people, even though they have a natural law inside of them because God sealed something in there, that you can overrule that by the mind. Every time that conviction comes up, the mind says, I don't need to be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. And talk themselves out of it. And next thing you know, they become a law unto themselves. And so America has become a law unto itself. I don't know if there's any, the only revival of the Holy Spirit is going to work. Because it's gonna, they're going to wax colder and colder as the day approaches. I mean, it's, it's happening. It's happening to us as Christians. We get desensitized. Next thing you know, the law doesn't scare us anymore. It's no biggie. I mean, a lot of things are happening in America. So we've got to watch out. Now, it is evident then that God's purpose in giving the law after the race had existed 2,500 years without it was to bring to guilty man 
the knowledge of his sin first, and then of his, of his utter helplessness in view of God's just requirements. So it is purely and only a ministration of condemnation and death. That's what it is. See, what the law cannot do is what we need to understand. In Romans 3.20, and I'm, I'm going through some of this. I know I was going slower at the beginning, but there's a lot of verses. and, and um, But in Romans 3.20, this is what the law cannot do. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And in Galatians 2.16, it says this, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And there's a whole study on this, meaning after, after the Old Testament economy. This took place because Jesus Christ had to die, buried, and was resurrected. But before that, there was another economy. It was called Moses. It was called the law. And under that, men were required to keep it. They were. And there's a lot of people that will come over here to the New Testament, use these verses to try to show that the Old Testament saints couldn't have done it. And then I come across the Pharisee named Paul, and God Almighty says, touching the law, blameless. Oh, that's a mistranslation. Eh, you better watch out. Because remember, they could maintain by sacrifices, couldn't they? Okay. Or they'd be stoned to death and so on and so forth. But they had to keep it during that time. Job was righteous. Anyway, that's another study right there. So, also... I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, Galatians 2.21. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith, Galatians 3.11. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, Condemn sin in the flesh, Romans 8, 3. And then in Acts 13, 39, it says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God, Hebrews seven nineteen. Right? So without those sacrifices in the law, nobody could have made it before. But they weren't complete. They were sitting in paradise until Jesus came and shed his perfect blood to cleanse the entire thing completely. Right? Okay. So you have, you have what the law cannot do, what the law was. And then we have <clears throat> the believer is not under the law. And... Um, the sixth of Romans, after declaring the doctrine of the believer's identification with Christ in his death, of which baptism is the symbol, if you ever go to chapter 6 and the first 10 verses, we find, beginning in verse 11, the declaration of the principles which should govern the walk of the believer, his rule of life. And this is the subject of the remaining 12 verses. And uh, when you get to Romans chapter 6, and I'm thinking that we ought to sort of stop in Romans chapter 6, because um, that'll be where we'll do some good study here. Let me make sure I mark my Bible too. As a matter of fact, what we'll, do, what we'll do today is we'll read the first ten verses as we get into the study of Romans chapter 6 here a little bit. The believer is not under the law, you know. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
Now, isn't that what they're saying, that they can do whatever they want under grace? I mean, it's just obvious to me is what they're saying to me. But yet they'll say, no, that ain't what we're saying. I said, why do you keep doing this? Then why'd you go back smoking? Why'd you go back doing this? Why'd you? Well, what are you trying to do? It's, it's not what I do that gets me to heaven. No kidding, Sherlock. Nobody's arguing how you're getting to heaven. It's what you're doing down here after you're saved. And when you say that the grace of God allows you to do all this stuff and God's not, not, not concerned about that, then you're going against the Bible. That's why in verse 1 it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2 says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, how? In newness of life. You know, the old man's dead. You don't do what you used to do. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed, that henceforth we should not what? Serve sin. So if you've got a habit, a bad habit, you don't make excuses for it so you can keep doing it and think everybody's going to say, yeah, okay, you can do that. No. You need victory in some areas. So you ask God for victory. You need some help. Verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Well, no kidding. Nobody in the graveyard is fighting sin. So it can't be talking about that. It's talking about your old man. We've got to tell our old man, shut up. You're dead. Leave me alone. Right? You've got to have power over that thing. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. What does all that mean? That means he's already resurrected. When you got saved, you have resurrected life. So in your, you're going to find out from verses... I better put verse 11 down. For verses 11, 11 on, we're going to see what it talks about. It's hard to comprehend sometimes. But uh, it's the truth nonetheless. It means Jesus Christ is in you. You've been sealed with his Holy Spirit. Spiritually, he's living in you. Therefore, spiritually, he has to live through you. If, if, if uh, you're doing something wrong, the Holy Spirit says no, right? Most of the time, he tells you no before you even do it. Because it's obvious he knows what's wrong. You don't, apparently. But yet you do if you're saved because there's something in there that, that sort of like lets you know. Well, that same thing that lets you know it's wrong is the same person that can help you do your life. And has got to live through you. And that's that power. And sometimes it comes easily for some things and sometimes it's more difficult. Because our mind operates our members. It's the motor. So if our mind is not sold on something, it's weak. And if it's weak, we're a pushover. But when we get sold and we get confident on something, we go ahead and do it. If you had to get money real quick for something that you wanted, I'm telling you, you'd think of all sorts of ways to do it. If there's something you want to get for your flesh, man, you come up with something. So that's why Romans, uh, God, uh, uh, you know, put these chapters in here to let you know how powerful... These laws are of your members, but he's more powerful because you've got to reckon the body dead. And these are hard concepts sometimes to get, but they're biblical. And so for somebody to make excuses for everything they do wrong, well, that's, that's sort of convenient. That's easy. I'm going to heaven anyway. Well, you may get there quicker, too, if you're God's kid. Because he's got enough verses in there to mess us up. I think somebody said there's over 600 different ordinances and stuff under Pauline epistles, let alone Old Testament dietary laws and everything. I mean, if you go through here, you're going to find out that a lot of Pauline epistles uh, have, have all sorts of Old Testament scripture in them. 
I mean, God should have told us that, right? You know, but uh, we're not under the law. We're under grace. But God forbid that we'd sin because of that.